cancer is the second leading cancer killer in the United States. It causes more cancer deaths among non-smokers than any other form of cancer. In New York City, almost 1,500 people die each year from this largely preventable form of cancer. And with us here to talk about these risk factors for colon cancer and how to prevent it is gastroenterologist Michael Lipp, clinical instructor at the Columbia University Medical Center, the Allen Hospital. Dr. Lipp, it's a pleasure having you on the program. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, what is gastroenterologist? What is your special, a specialty? So gastroenterology is a field that many people don't know. It's actually a subset of internal medicine, uh, which is essentially adult medicine. Um, a gastroenterology is, specializes in the treatment of uh, all of the organs of the gastrointestinal tract. It involves the esophagus, the stomach, uh, the liver, the pancreas, the small intestine, and the colon. And so treatment of colon cancer is uh, one part of the, of the field itself. So what are the other things that a gastroenterologist would treat? So the more common conditions that a gastroenterologist would treat would be things like uh, esophageal reflux, um, uh, gastric ulcers, um, problems with uh, the pancreas, uh, gallstones, uh, liver disease like hepatitis, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Um, and, uh, and prevention of colon cancer is a, is a major part of our field. So most of the time when we come see a gastroenterologist, it's either because we have a problem or it's because we have this checkup that at a certain age we need something done, right? It's actually generally both of those. Um, generally, it, patients will come in because they have a symptom. They'll have abdominal pain uh, or they'll refer for a problem, like uh, they found out that they had hepatitis C, uh, for example. And then on the other side, we have patients who are here for colorectal cancer screening. And so that sort of screening may involve something like a colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are the tests that you would perform to determine what it is that is wrong with the patient? Uh, for, it depends on uh, the symptom that would, they'd be presenting with. So uh, generally for colorectal cancer screening, uh, patients are generally asymptomatic because it's a screening test. If they have other symptoms such as weight loss, if they have um, they become constipated, um, bleeding, or other sort of symptoms, we'll do a workup appropriate to whatever the symptoms are for that patient. Mm -hmm. I'm getting at the colonoscopy, though. Right. I mean, uh, at what age should people, men and women, uh, have their first colonoscopy? This is something that doesn't necessarily require any problem, any symptoms. It's mm -hmm. just a preventable thing that everyone should do. Exactly. Um, and one of the biggest problems with colonoscopy is that patients generally go to the doctor when they have symptoms. And so colonoscopy is for anyone over the age of 50. And both men and women? Men and women. Okay. No one's excluded. No, I thought it was a different age for, for men and, and for so women. So there are different risk factors. So men are actually have a little bit of a higher incidence uh, than women do. But as far as uh, the general population, I use 50 years of age as a, a cutoff for getting screened. Mm -hmm. And um, then how often, after the first one, how often do you have to keep going back for this? Yeah, well it, it depends on the results of the colonoscopy. Um, just to preface the, the 50 years old, there's a lot of things that go into that. 50 years old is for an average risk person. So if you have a strong family history, um, if you have other risk factors, uh, you may need to get screened earlier than that. So yeah. definitely if you have a, a history of colon cancer in your family, exactly. then you have to start it all earlier. Exactly. If you have one family member with colon cancer, we generally recommend that uh, you have a, a screening colonoscopy at age 40 um, or 10 years younger than your first degree family member had colon cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, if you have uh, more than one family member, you may want to get an evaluation to really look at your family tree so you really know the genetics. You may have a genetic disorder within the family, and if that's the case, you may need to have a different type of screening. Mm -hmm. are, are we need, do we need to be worried about, when it comes to hereditary illnesses like mm -hmm. this, uh, does a parent who may, or a, a relative who may have had another form of cancer, could that also be a risk for colon cancer or not? There are some syndromes that have different types of cancers. Um, the details of them get a little bit complicated, but if you have a family history where many people have different types of cancer, such as uh, endometrial cancer mixed in with colon cancer, there's some syndromes where people can have different types of cancer. And if that's the case, uh, you should be seen by uh, not necessarily someone within gastroenterology, but someone who can do uh, some genetic counseling to, to see if that runs in your family. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I want to talk about the colonoscopy because I've had one. I've had one done and I think I'm due for another one now. It's been a few years. Um, more or less, again, every five years, is that when they're supposed to, you know, if, you, if everything turns out well the mm -hmm. first time you go in for your checkup, mm -hmm. when do they normally suggest you should come back? Well, for a normal colonoscopy, so someone goes in at age 50, has a normal colonoscopy, generally the guidelines would suggest anywhere between five years and 10 years, generally around 10 years. Um, there's a couple of reasons why you may want to come back earlier than 10 years if maybe the preparation wasn't perfect. Uh, if they found a polyp, uh, of course, um, you may need to come back earlier. But if everything is perfect, uh, there is a good visualization of the colon, meaning you drank all of the prep and everything looks clean. Uh, 10 years uh, from the, the last colonoscopy is what we would recommend. Mm -hmm. and, and my producer wrote here a question that I, I have the answer for. It, it says, will it hurt? I know it doesn't hurt because <laughs> I had it done. I mean, all you do is go to sleep and then you wake up and it's over. But I, I, from what I remember, doctor, it, the, the, what is really bad about the whole process is the day before. Exactly. Getting ready for this test. Exactly. Tell us about it. So that's the biggest uh, problem with the colonoscopy is the preparation. Um, generally, the, the colonoscopy itself, patients generally don't remember it. Uh, very nervous, show up, and then yep. wake up and say, when are you going to start? And it's already over. Yep. yep. And that's... And I woke up very, very hungry for some reason. Right. Does that happen a lot? People wake <laughs> it does, up like, say, because we have you not eat the morning. In up, the morning, so wake up very early hungry. in the morning without anything to eat. And then when you wake up, all you want to do is have coffee. And, and they gave me this piece of bread that was the best bread I've ever had for some reason. <laughs> but, but again, uh, w once you go through this process and you wake up and you realize it wasn't a big deal, then you come back, uh, at least I did, and I said to myself, my God, yesterday was a lot worse than today because you have to drink all mm -hmm. that stuff. When you explain, explain to folks what it entails to, to clean yourself out for this, pro for this test. So, so let me talk a little bit about um, what a colonoscopy is and why the prep is important. And okay. Usually that's the most important thing to explain to the patient is why you need to drink the PrEP. So the point of the colonoscopy is twofold. Uh, one is to diagnose if you have colon cancer, to catch it at an early stage where it's treatable. The other important thing about colon, uh, colonoscopy is to look for polyps. And the reason why colonoscopy is such a good test is that if there are small polyps, it's thought that the polyps slowly get bigger over many years, over a span of 10 years. You don't, you don't only go in and look, but if you find a polyp, exactly. you take it out right, right there. Exactly. It's an operation. And so, it's, in, it's in a, a procedure, way. right? Yeah. Uh, so part of the benefit of the colonoscopy is not just to test, but to treat. And that if you have a polyp that would have become a colon cancer, we can see the polyp at the time of the colonoscopy, and we can take it out and prevent it from uh, turning into a cancer. So every polyp that you take out, you must put through some testing. Exactly. They, they all get evaluated, and based on the res results of the polypectomy, as we would call it, mm -hmm. uh, we determine when your next colonoscopy would be or if you need further testing. So part of why that's important is because if patients understand that removing polyps is so important, it's important that we get really good visualization of the colon. And the only way that you can do that is to take your PrEP properly. Part of the problem with the PrEP is it does not taste very good. Um, there, part it's a of, lot of this It's a lot of liquid. liquid that you have to the, drink. The taste isn't great, but it's important that the patients drink the entire preparation because that's the only way that we're going to get proper visualization and really prevent colon cancer the best way the best way possible. Mm -hmm. uh, do you need to be totally sedated uh, to do this or are there other ways of doing it? I was totally knocked out and I thought it's great because by the time I woke up it was over. But do people do it while they're awake also? You know, that's a very, it's a cultural thing. Um, there was actually a large study in Poland where none of the patients had sedation at all. Uh, so uh, here in the U.S. and in New York, we tend to sedate patients with what we call moderate sedation to where you're breathing on your own, um, you're arousable, uh, but you're comfortable, and uh, they give you medication so you're comfortable during the procedure, but it doesn't require a breathing tube, there's no other, uh, you're able to, to breathe on your own and you're able to be woken up if needed. So that's what happened to me then. Exactly. It was, it was moderate sedation. It was, they could have woken me up any moment. Exactly. I see. Okay, so can, I, I, I guess you, you already answered the question. When you do it without sedation, is it painful? Uh, generally not painful. Most of the symptoms that patients will have if they have it unsedated, which is relatively uncommon here in the U.S., um, is more of a pressure-like sensation, but not really pain itself. Mm. Um, and, but when we give the, the sedation, uh, patients are very comfortable and they don't remember any of it. 
but more of a pressure sensation. So are there any medications that uh, a patient might be taking that they need to stop taking before they go through this process? Is there anything that they need to really clear out of their system? Uh, generally, people are taking iron. Iron pills, we like to stop that because iron uh, makes the stools very dark. So we like to have good pictures, so we'll have them stop that at least five days to a week before the procedure. Um, any liquids that are red that may be confused with blood, we have patients not drink that just the day before. But otherwise, you can take all your regular medications. Um, in the past, they, they had uh, patients stop taking their aspirin. But now we, we've learned that continuing your aspirin is very important. So we, don't, we have patients continue their aspirin even though they're having a colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. Our, uh, is, it, is it safe to assume that all uh, physicians who are treating uh, uh, folks are equally qualified to do this? Or is there a risk factor in who you choose as your doctor? So that's a, that's a great question. So that's an area that we're looking into and that they're trying to determine uh, which physicians, uh, they look at quality by physician. And a certain benchmarks they use to determine uh, if physicians are really doing the exam properly. And that was an area they didn't really look at before. If you were a gastroenterologist, they would assume that your colonoscopy was an optimal colonoscopy. Mm. But there's a couple of things that we've started looking at. One of them is withdrawal times meaning uh, we finish the colonoscopy, we get to the cecum, which is essentially the end of the colon. And physicians that came back very quickly uh, missed a lot of polyps. And so one of the things that we do is uh, count the time of the colonoscopy to make sure that you're really taking your time and you're really looking through uh, the colon properly to make sure you don't miss a polyp. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing that they do. Another one is adenoma detection rates to make sure that uh, your patient population uh, you're really catching all of those polyps that you're looking for. And so the, at Columbia, that's one of the things that we do is we, we make sure that our physicians have uh, very high rates in those regards. Mm -hmm. Are there risks involved with this whole process? <laughs> not doing it right? I mean, not knowing, if the doctor doesn't know what he's doing or is, right. is not very experienced at it, uh, what are the risks? That's another great question. There are risks. Um, the, the, the risk rates that we quote are somewhere in the order of one in a thousand to one in five thousand. Um, the main risks uh, are perforation of the colon or bleeding. Um, generally, when that happens, uh, it's very treatable. But the, it is a risk that people uh, need to be aware of, and it's something that we discuss uh, before the procedure. Um, and those risks are lower with more experienced gastroenterologists. Uh, they're lower with gastroenterologists as opposed to other types of doctors, like internal medicine doctors or people who have less experience doing it. So the greater the doctor's experience, the lower the complication rate. So you are actually able to see inside the human body with the little camera that you send up there, right? Exactly. Uh, and and how, do you re how do you tell that there's a polyp or that, every, that everything is normal or it isn't normal? Is it obvious right away? What happens when you're doing this search? Well, a lot of it comes with experience uh, and knowing the landmarks of where you are in the colon. Um, there's certain uh, things that we look for. One of the things we look for is if you're in the cecum, which is cecum is essentially the end of the colon. Um, and we take pictures and throughout the procedure, we're very careful to examine to make sure that we didn't miss an area. Mm. And so that being said, colonoscopy isn't a perfect test. It's one of the best screening tests we have. Uh, it, it can catch up to 75 to 90 percent of uh, advanced adenomas if done correctly. Um, but it isn't perfect, and sometimes some polyps are missed. Mm. Uh, what if you find something and you send it for, for tests and it comes back and it is cancerous? Uh, then what happens to the, to the patient and where do you take it from there? So when, the, when that happens, uh, the first thing we do is sit with the patient and explain what we found, explain what that means. Uh, it, during the time of the colonoscopy, if we find something that looks like it's cancerous, we send it off for testing. Um, if it shows that it is cancerous, the next thing we do is uh, get an oncologist involved and make sure we understand the extent of the colon cancer. Um, hopefully it's a very limited extent, and in that case, um, a very small surgery, if needed, uh, can be done to remove the cancer. Uh, if there's need for chemotherapy, we usually involve different types of expertise with oncologists, uh, with surgeons, and we get a whole team involved to make sure that we treat the patient correctly. And this is why early detection is so important. Because exactly. Because, again, if the, if the uh, polyp or whatever you find is very, very small, all the easier to treat. Exactly. And if, if these lesions are caught very early, 
Ideally, they're caught before they become cancer. They're caught when they're a polyp. Right. And you remove the polyp, and the patient is able to uh, live about his or her life and, and not develop cancer. And that's what we aim for. It's been terribly educational. Thank you for being on the program. We right. really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's, it's wonderful.